Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So, <clears throat> what I want to do is share a number of ideas I've uh, been working with or thinking about. Uh, my talk isn't quite as tight as Steve, uh, Stephen Michael's was, which had, you know, just a real logic to it and uh, wonderful illustrations. But I've, I've got a number of bodies of text that I want to, to share with you and uh, think about different aspects of uh, community conservation and that entire social and political process. So I'm going to try to look at the, the, the issue of responsibility uh, as it applies in governance and as it relates to international changes in how responsibility is, is managed and how that then applies to community-based conservation. Um, so the, one of the central questions we have is whether and how conservation organizations and the institutions, I, I talked to you, I guess, a couple days ago about the institutional fabric or network uh, that bears on conservation. And, uh, can this work to the benefit of communities? I think that's our central question. We go to communities, some of them will say, you know, why are, why are we giving most of our, our good land to this uh, uh, organization? We don't see any benefits. And I think this is a real, a real challenge. Another dimension is cultural ontology, and that's just a way of saying, uh, are there aspects to indigenous peoples' philosophies and ways of uh, looking at life that bear on whether uh, the conservation process will be appreciated and how it will be embraced and pursued? And what about the interests? And here, when I say interests, I mean economic but other interests. And this, of course, is the language of uh, economists. Can we look at the interests that are served or not served by by uh, conservation and make an assessment then in terms of the, the cultural aspects, the institutional aspects, and the, uh, and the economic or interest-based uh, aspects. And that's why I've put what, what I see as the three major uh, factors, institutions, ontologies, and interests. And I think this covers a, a good deal of what the social sciences have to contribute to understanding conservancies. Um, another dimension that we, is, is what we've been calling environmentality, and that has to do with the, 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 the cultural and cognitive orientation people have. One of my own senses at the end of the day is that conservation may never generate enough money that will go through the system such that people's um, needs are, are, are fulfilled. Um, and in that sense, it probably won't fully succeed unless people have somehow assimilated the environmentality or, 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 or conservation ethic as something that's intrinsically valuable. Because uh, you know, we'll have to see, as our economist, like Lugusa, who's working in Sambu, let's see what the economics look like. But I, I have a feeling that it will never be enough. But if something comes in, people identify with it. Uh, and here I have the experience of North America where um, there may be 50% who are, are not interested in the environment, but boy, you have 50% and that includes most of the young people are feel that this is the direction of history. They want to be part of it and they identify with, uh, with conservation. So the, the conservancy paradigm, what I've, what I've tried to do um, and we, we, we had a workshop with students at McGill to work out what are the actual factors that are involved. And it seemed to me that, that there's some very important factors that aren't talked about enough. Uh, to have a, a conservancy, you have to have a, a community or a partnership, uh, a group that has an interest in pursuing conservation. You also need a set of leaders because very often the, the group as a whole can't function, uh, all of them, as decision makers. They need a, a, a set of leaders. And often, those who are leaders and say they represent the community, their, their linkages may be tenuous, or maybe they're authentic. 
but you, the leadership is there, they position themselves, and they have to be, uh, they have to be dealt with. And you also have the, uh, the state. The state is never absent. The state is always there. And the state can make things work or not work. They can do it by uh, just standing aside, or they can become engaged. But we can't, uh, Eleanor Ostrom uh, taught this lesson in her work on common property. And that was that the state always has the capacity to come in and make things fail. And therefore, you have to always think, if you're going to have a common resource system that, that, that works, if there's all the factors at the local level uh, that, that can make it work or not, but you can never ignore the state, because the state can come in and be the, the one that plays the key card. So don't forget the state, but I, I, you all know that. So um, you have these different elements, and what I haven't put in here, but I, th I thought I had there, which is absolutely central, is the, uh, the investor. Uh, when I look at all the cases of conservancies, and we think about them as community-based, um, you always find somewhere a party from the outside who's bringing something in, which is usually some money, some capital. And so that is a very critical role. And you might say, well, why don't we get rid of that person or that company and just operate community to, to tourists? Well, that doesn't seem to have functioned. So wherever you look, there's going to be the investment hidden. Maybe he's there parent. And so we have this, we have the state, we have the community, we have leadership, and we have, uh, we have the investor. And there, there, it seems to be a pattern that's always there. And all these uh, roles have got to be uh, considered. And the conservancies that, uh, that rise up and are developed, I, I've said there, there's an aspect of nemesis, because they look very much like, in some, in some respects, they look very much like protected areas. They sort of function like little national parks or or uh, game reserves, they have a particular area, they have facilities, they've got uh, uh, the ability to bring in visitors or tourists to see something. So it looks like they, there's a model of a park that they're mimicking, but it's within the community and the community is, is, is crucial to it. So they mimic the structure of the, of the conservancy. Now I wanted in, to introduce an idea of the devolution of responsibility. And here I'm, I'm following on some of the recent work of uh, Arun Agarwal, <coughs> who is also a major source for the concept of environmentality. He did work in, uh, in South Asia, in, in India, in the forest areas of Kumam, um, and uh, has been really a very important uh, driving force in the evolution of, of theory and ideas about, uh, about uh, common property and conservancies. So I, I want to just mention the issue of fashion. Fashion is just simply what ideas that come up and are adopted. And we can't ever ignore, I mean, we could ignore it, but we can't pretend it's not there, which is the link to ideas that are tried out in Washington and London in particular, and in other places as well. Uh, so the idea of the conservancy, it's so important now in East Africa. This was gestating at the, in the international level and came down from about the, the mid-1980s. Um, and what I wanted to just mention is the, the, the devolution process in terms of how development policy, as it applies to uh, conservation, uh, developed. In particular, having to do with responsibility. And their responsibility, I mean, not just an individual virtue, but the structure of where decisions are made and ultimately who has the responsibility to implement them. And one aspect of top-down responsibility, which of course was, was the structure through which the major parks and reserves were formed. We, we've, we've, we now call that, um, what is it called? Um, not ivory tower, but fortress. Fortress, uh, fortress conservation, where basically a, an entity is created and there's a perimeter <coughs> and there's monitoring of it, it can, has a security dimension 
Uh, but this, it was very clear who was in charge. It was the state. And the idea of responsibility, if you wanted to know why this was going on, you went back and there were a set of people who, who made this happen. So responsibility was clear. And of course, in, uh, in some of the countries of, of, uh, of Africa, this was through a socialist system, and therefore you had the centralization of, of authority was clearly resting on a, a, a clear principle of how socialist states would function. And uh, even though they're now in a post-socialist uh, state, that residue of who is finally in charge is, uh, I think, can be tracked back to the, the socialist uh, philosophies. And uh, the, the Yellowstone model, which well, I guess the Yellowstone Park in the United States was the, uh, it was the first of these great parks. If anybody gets a chance to visit uh, that area, yeah, it's a fabulous, uh, uh, fabulous park. Well worth a, a visit. Um, but of course, in all of these parks that were formed, we should never, ever forget, they were purchased at the expense of indigenous peoples. Were the indigenous people in Yellowstone? Well, they're, they're not there, that's for sure. Maybe they're in a reserve or a reservation outside, but in some cases they're just dispersed. They're not there anymore. So when, you, when we're thinking about places where indigenous people are so important and strong in countries that are run by, uh, uh, by Africans, let's not forget that there are costs, and it's the cost of the, of the, of the displacement of the indigenous people. Of course, those who, uh, from Tanzania who've been looking at um, the, the question of indigenous people and, and parks. Uh, you've got the people of Ngorongoro who are now displaced to the, to the west. You've got the people of Nkubazi, which is much uh, more recent, and they've been, they were pushed out. They even won their case. They brought a case, and uh, they protested, and they won without remedy, mm -hmm. which I think is a fascinating way to win a case. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, they, at the end of the day, they lost. So this is top-down responsibility, and it, it's clear. We can, we can, of course, look at uh, the, the problems of top-down uh, management is, uh, to some extent, that these are really large areas, and how do you actually monitor them? And if you, you look at the experience of the National Forest in California, where the only way they've managed is that to legalize the incursions of the ranchers from the area come in and and do grazing in these, uh, these areas. So it sounds as if they're sealed off. And we can, of course, see the Mao Forest, uh, the politics of which have been uh, evolving in, in Kenya, where the forest is, is, is certainly not very sacrosanct, and the Maasai Mara, where it's continually in, uh, in constant uh, interaction with, uh, with neighboring herders. So the notion that you actually have a top-down responsibility with a, a definite a sealed off uh, park doesn't really seem to work out that way when you really look at the cases. Okay, bottom up. So something emerged in the mid-80s, and this was the idea that there should be community-based conservation. I mean, this was uh, an important initiative. Uh, Kenya was, was one of the first to initiate uh, bottom-up uh, responsibility, three minutes. Um, <laughs> and, and the whole idea is that, that, con uh, that communities would be, have greater responsibility. So you devolve responsibility to the communities and they would function and, and run their own conservancies. Uh, that's the ideology. And I'm, I'm going to cast a little bit of doubt on whether it actually is as bottom up as, as uh, they say. Um, and I think this is an important issue of, of systematic research to examine the bottom-up nature of responsibility. Um, and I'm going to suggest that sideways responsibility is, in fact, the way things have been uh, operating. You have this network of institutions, um, and the uh, some of them were, as I mentioned the other day, uh, inspired by Kipok and Pido, and there are a whole set of institutions that interact with communities, and I think uh, uh, impact would be a very important uh, case of, uh, of this, but you have so many other institutions. And this, the responsibility is, is, is held by many of these institutions in overlapping ways. 
Uh, and of course, if some are active and others are passive, that's going to determine how much responsibility they accrue to, to themselves. Um, Clerkson Lagusa is one, one of our PhD students. He's been looking at the economics of uh, conservancies in, uh, in Saburu. And after our conversation, I went out and uh, identified which four he's working in. Uh, there, there are the four. Um, and, and one thing that he's done recently that I thought was quite fascinating is he, he did a, a, an inventory of all the institutions and organizations that these different uh, conservancies were um, were engaged with. And um, can you see it? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so the, the, there are a few. The, the, of course, the KWS, the Lewa, the Northern Rangeland Trust, where, where we have a representative from there, the uh, AWF, um, the Investors <coughs> Group, uh, the police, local conservancies, others. Uh, NRT Trading, our representatives from NRT Trading, uh, the county government, the Kenny Forest Service, and then a set of organizations that are conservation-minded, uh, like the uh, Iwaso Lions, the Greedy's Zebra Trust, uh, Save the Elephants, uh, the National Drought Management Authority, the Department of Water, Environment, and Natural Resources, the San Diego Zoo, uh, Safe Samburu, other conservations. So there's all these different groups, and they all play a different role. And, uh, they have distinct responsibilities, but they manage, uh, with some coordination from the conservancy itself, to to play a role. But to look at the success or, or failure of a, a conservancy, one has to look across these array of, of sideways ex the organizations that are exercising sideways authority. Um, I wanted to look at the flows of capital um, and the nature of an investment and the sort of returns that they want to, uh, to look at. Um, and so let me just say that that's an important uh, issue. Um, spirit of enterprise seems to be something fundamental. And so those who are engaged in conservation and simply an ethic, uh, a responsibility that comes from uh, the need to be re responsible for wildlife. Let's consider that there's always a spirit of enterprise uh, that's involved. Um, the neoliberal fallacy, and of course, uh, if, if we want to track the origins of neoliberalism, it would be at the same time that, that governments were giving up responsibility over many uh, operations, development processes in rural areas. Suddenly you didn't have extension services. It was thought to be Private sector should handle that. Suddenly, uh, health services were not uh, free. People had to come and pay their, their portions. Uh, so at the same time that organizations were expanding, you had a sense of neoliberalization of the way the state functioned. It was a devolution of responsibility to the people themselves or to uh, lower levels. And uh, you know, we can we consider, in, in some sense, um, there's, there's a neoliberal fallacy uh, because that it suggests that the, uh, the market should be determining this or that. And, and I'm, I'm a little, I think we have to track the market. Market plays its role, but uh, is it enough? Um, ontologies and the breaches of conservation. I've got a couple there. Let me just take one second to talk about respecting for citizens, uh, at least in the initial stages of looking across the results of, uh, of the research, there's something critical, which is when it fails, it's often the investor is not showing respect for the communities that they're working with. And when they show that respect, that it, it can be financial, but it can be just simply including people in decision making. That's the basis for success. So it, it's, it's uh, it's institutionalized. If we go back to my original three ideas, there's an institutional aspect. There may be an economic uh, aspect, and uh, but we we have to see respect as, as essential in whether conservancies will uh, succeed. Thank you. Do we have some questions for John?
on. Uh, yeah. the, um, at one point you say, apart from the exclusion of indigenous people from places like Yellowstone, the fortress conservation model made a certain sense, you know, I guess because it protected areas from rampant clearance for ranching or industrial forestry or, or, or the like. Um, um, the models we have in Canada, really the counterparts of Yellowstone, as you go north, are, are Banff and Jasper. Right. Um, and, um, you know, where, where it's, it's become clearer that the removal of indigenous people actually was negative for the ecology. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've heard some of that. Of research, but uh, for example, photographs taken in the 1880s of some of these beautiful meadow land valley bottoms, they're now completely grown in with forest mm. right down to the riverbanks because um, the uh, indigenous inhabitants would burn, would control, would maintain grasslands for elk, for deer. And there was a whole community of life around these valley bottoms. Um, and some of those animals are still there, but the interesting thing that's happened is that, there, that the biodiversity has shifted actually to the edges of, of forest. Where you will see the most animals are, are where forest joins ranch land. Right? So, and, and there's the degradation of some riverbanks and fish spawning areas has also occurred because with the meadowlands now growing in with forest, the herbivores that come to drink don't fear the predators anymore. They can come and, be, and they can hang around the riverbanks concealed. Whereas in the past, they would come from the forest, they'd get down through the meadows, they'd drink, and they'd get back to the forest where the wolves and the bears couldn't see them. So th there's been a whole I'm sure it's the same in Yellowstone, it's the, a radical ch change, you know, and so I guess that leads to my question that, you know, when you talk about conservancies and, and a certain tendency to mirror some of what the state has been doing, are you talking about areas that, um, where lively, pastoral livelihood, for example, is still an integral part of the grassland ecology, or are you talking about areas where, you know, people are being excluded, these activities are being excluded for the, in the interest of maximizing um, a certain aesthetic for tourism and a certain bioproductivity for certain species. I'm sure it works different in the African context than it does in British Columbia or Idaho or Utah or wherever, but uh, um, I guess this also relates to the, the theme of you know, of, of uh, conservation territories, in uh, territories of life, as the idea has been uh, uh, developing in the consortium, that, uh, uh, that uh, as, a, as a general rule, the assumption now is that conservation with uh, uh, appropriately integrated traditional activities is actually better conservation than fortress conservation, even from a strictly biological perspective. The, um, I mean, my, my depiction is, is uh, the evolution of notions of responsibility. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and I was pointing out the cost. Every time you look at a, you know, one of these wonderful parks, uh, like Yellowstone, it's been at a cost. And yeah. you've just pointed out the ecological side of the coin. Mm -hmm. uh, of the displacement of, uh, yeah. of uh, indigenous peoples. And uh, so th this is not an uh, old history here in uh, East Africa. It's an ongoing dynamic. Uh, and the, the dynamic isn't just the exclusion of people from, from the parks, which of course is, is built into the whole notion of, you know, the um, original, wild nature, uh, which in some ways is, um, is, is profoundly false for some of the reasons you just said. Uh, there's, there's a work by Robin Reed, uh, her, her book, 
uh, which came out, I think, uh, three years ago. I've been using it in my, in my course. And she reviews some of this uh, recent ecology, ecological work, and, uh, and, and points out the, uh, you know, why is it that you have, uh, let's say, the Maasai Mara, and of course the Maasai Mara is one of the richest areas of biodiversity, it's an incredible place, but often, like you've been describing, you find a, a good deal of the wildlife is outside that park. Why? Because they're coming into the places where uh, livestock are, are kept. Uh, and you, you can see if you do the uh, aerial uh, photography, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm told, uh, you can see literally the wildlife coming and following the herds. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a very deep uh, symbiosis <coughs> between wildlife and livestock, and it's not recent. We're talking about probably 7,000 years of co-adaptation. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so the conservancies are, are very often in East Africa, not always, but very often right outside the park. And uh, so there's a sort of a interaction there. So the wildlife, in fact, comes into the conservancy because this is a place that's close to, to, uh, to ranching or to pastoral. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of parallels. I mean, we should think of doing something that would draw those parallels. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, there, one of the presented, uh, which is actually the case uh, in many, uh, in many controversies uh, in East Africa, is one where you have some external energy, I mean, uh, agency uh, in form of uh, uh, an investor, an um, organization conservation organization, uh, capital, um, that then works with the local community um, to create uh, a conservancy and pursue um, co 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 conservation practice. Uh, I just trying to compare that to the, the, the image that we got yesterday from the um, ICC and then, uh, indigenous conservation areas that are pristine in a way without much uh, external agency. Um, and I would just try to picture a conservation uh, model where con indigenous, I mean, communities of people practice conservation for conservation reasons or I mean like do you, do we need I mean is there a possibility of coming up with a model like the way that we're saying which does not necessarily include an external agency. I don't need to get what I'm trying to say. I mean they yeah, I think I do I understand what you're what you're getting at. Uh, because there was a sort of a <coughs> model which was you know, it's communities seizing their own destinies and declaring ICCAs. Yeah. And I asked uh, one of them if they could, were they in, in Maasai land? Because here we are working in Kenya and Tanzania. I don't know where there's an ICCA, but maybe they're there. And maybe you all know. Um, I, I, I think there's a little bit of romanticization, yes. <laughs> but it, uh, perhaps it, um, is the state really not there in these ICCAs? I, I think the state's there somewhere, uh, allowing it to happen. Um, so, so I think the, the, the realism about how they actually function, how the communities interact with, with protected areas and they create conservancies and they bring in an investor, I think that's what's actually happening. Uh, uh, but I'd like to pursue it more with uh, Garcia and that group to find out uh, how, how these, in fact, come into being, uh, what they do in terms of state regulation and uh, state uh, officials, mm -hmm. whether they tend to be um, sort of para-park entities like so many of our conservancies that are basically grabbing something of benefit from the park, or whether like the old Kamatian, uh, they tend to be sort of self-standing. Yeah. Let's find out. Mm -hmm. Michael. The idea of devolution, you know, talk about devolution of responsibility. The, the devolution as a concept, as an appeal, and I think of Kenya, devolution as a concept has an appeal 
because of the history of how power, political power, has been used from within a centralized state. So within the context of our reform processes, evolution is a key thing. But from your presentation, a number of things strike me. One is, uh, is the fact that often when you think about devolution, you think about it in terms of governance. But when you talk about natural resources and land, there is governance and there is management. Governance being the decision making, the political power processes and so on. Management being the planning, conservation and, and, you know, and uh, implementation of plans. And within the context of, of conservation, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it almost appears like when you talk about devolving responsibility, not if we are talking about devolving, uh, we, we devolve responsibility, but we don't address the issue of whether that comes with expanded benefits for communities. So in a sense, in, in, you know, one could say we are devolving functions, but we're not devolving rights and benefits. And, and, and the appeal of devolution is not just that decisions are being made at the local level, but there is an assumption that decisions being made at the local level means that benefits are being better distributed at the local level. And that, that appears to me to be something that we haven't really thought about much when we think about uh, devolution with respect to not just conservation, but natural resource management. And I think within conservation, uh, at least in the context of Kenya, when um, I'm thinking about Stephen's question, uh, the, 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 the basic problem is that conservation is, if allow, you allow me to say this, is owned by external interests. Historically, Kenya's conservation has been a preserve of foreign interests. And those foreign interests have continued. They have, you know, mo uh, the, over time, they have morphed into different characteristics, you know, they, you know, uh, so you have, even when conservancy started, it's not a, there's no discussion about communities, but now they've been made, there's more talk about community <coughs> conservancies. But in my view, to, to sanitize, you know, to, to, to make this more appealing, but in reality, the, the whole conservation sector appears to me to be in the grips of an interest that is not just external to the community, but even external to the country. And, 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 and whenever we, we, when we think about this, we have to be alive to the fact that there are, there are certain decisions, certain powers that, in my view, even our government isn't clearly in control of. And those limit the opportunities for whatever reforms we do in terms of bringing the vision making the local level. So the, um, w when I talked about the connection between devolution and the, the, the liberalism that came in from the 19, uh, mid 80s, you could say the political aspect didn't really, wasn't realized until 2010 when the, the constitution was, uh, was changed. But devolution had already occurred in, in many other areas. I'm not necessarily talking about governance, but suddenly, the, the the people of Kenya had to pay for health services. Well, that's a that's a definite devolution. They can't walk into a clinic. But it's a, it's a whole series of things. So the devolving responsibility, not not benefits. That's not, right. Yeah. That's right. Not rights. So so it, when they began to uh, <coughs> to alter the structure of uh, taxation, et cetera, then you then you have, in a sense, the the financial aspects uh, following up. But the, um, I, I, I'm sort of suggesting that we not miss the fact that several things went together, and one was the state absolving itself of responsibility for its citizenry. I think that's a bad thing. On the other hand, they also allowed for civil society to come up. I think that's a good thing. And uh, so you begin to have energy at lo uh, lower, lower levels. And at the same time, you have the idea of the community-based uh, conservation initiatives, which in general, I think, is a, a very good uh, process. So I think the, uh, assessing neoliberalism, just to say that neoliberalism is a, is a, uh, the, the, there, there's an alternative 
And of course, the implicit thing is back to socialism. But if, we're, if it's a pick and choose, we could say, well, let's emphasize this and let's downplay, uh, downplay that. And so that was the, the point of my exposition. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the role of investors, that was just, just that it was a descriptive account. What goes into it? It's just simply what's happening. And I'm not saying whether that's good or bad. You, know, you can always say, whether it be the oil sector or whatever, uh, if you don't have an outside investor, you've got to come up with in, internal capital. Uh, and so, in, in, in some sense, uh, that in some cases can be done, and in some cases uh, can't. So that's a fairly neutral. I'm not trying to call the winners or losers. It's just simply what's happening. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the, you know, the, the where power resides, and by saying talking about the para aspect, uh, the sideways. Uh, I, I think there is responsibility and power that's dispersed among these institutions. They're, 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 they're playing a role. And I think that's maybe a, a way that uh, communities can capture some of that energy and, and capital. That's sort of what's happening. Uh, I think you take out all those institutions, you've got just the, the community itself facing a, a, a pretty tough future. Correction, I think. Michael, do you see that um, conservation has always been an interest of external forces? If you be in the kind of conservation which now involves protected areas, parts and things like that. Conservation as an industry. Because of the nature, yeah, as an industry. Because of you, yeah. you and I know that. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. it is community that always practice their conservation as an industry. Sorry, Stephen. Uh, we might. Have, I know you have a question. We're just. We're gonna have to move on, otherwise we're we're gonna end up way behind for the day. But we can save some of this discussion for a bit later. I would. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> sure. What I'm going to present is, is connected to what John uh, said. Sure. Uh, I think it will be a little easier to understand what I'll be saying because it's a, a product that's embedded in the larger picture. That so you're suggesting you want to... I just say one more thing. Okay. Yes, yeah. Sure. Uh, John, thank you very much for this. Uh, and the calling. Shakespeare, what is his name? Uh, Churchill. Said the further back, you can see. The further forward, you can also see. The gentlemen with the young generation is always to see themselves as if the world has started now. That's right. <laughs> Uh, in my area, when I got involved in this, I was at the middle of time to read the way all this conservation ethic is coming from. You read your comics, you remember the 50s, Buffalo Bee, those big game hunters, they wiped out of the American. But the 1950s guys realized what was the other one, the, the dove that flew yeah, over the Passenger pigeon. Fears. They wiped them out. Sierra and the other guys realize that hey, things are happening here. And they're especially picking up from the British. So that is the early conservationists realize that you know we're depleting wildlife, whether it's Bizon, India, and they created these uh, conservation areas. Now, that issue you are talking about, I which call it that. The indigenous people were regarded as baby. <laughs> you know, when they, they remove them. And this is what has happened. The fortress thing here in Kenya, in uh, Zambia, they created the Okafue National Park and they removed the people. In fact, they put people out and put them in another tribe, which, you know, because they're not part of the conservation. So it's important that we understand where these things are coming from. And uh, what I will speak about is actually embedded is a product, a micro product of that larger picture that we've painted. But if we don't understand that, then we're starting to deal with these uh, little things which won't solve. A, a good case we brought in 1992, you know, there were all these neoliberal fallacies, as you call it. They removed the, the conservation. They privatized the, the wildlife. You know where the wildlife you come. By the way, it's not Socialism for us, 1964, you know, in Britain there was the Labour Party. So Kaunda and the group took over the socialist systems from the Labour Party and implemented 
interesting. So yeah, it's a very good uh, background, but it's very important to emphasize where these things are coming from. It's not just happening like now. This is all historical process. And I'm happy that, you know, there's this, uh, what he has just said, our ICC phase. They're a product of where we are coming from. And genetically, some of what is there is embedded in that thing. So it cannot be the answer. You know, uh, it's, it's a whole complex. I mean, an investor is part of the genes of this whole setup. So you must find space for them. But like nature, if it goes above a certain level, it becomes a pathogen. So it's a how you embed it in this whole thing that I think is what you are trying to, to do. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I just wanted to. Thank you. I look forward to your <laughs> presentation. So it looks like the.